Well, today we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and because Christ is living, we are living too, spiritually. As Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. John fourteen nineteen. Now this morning we're going to consider the revelation of the mystery as the Apostle Paul calls it in Romans 16.25, which is Christ in you. Now, the reason Christ dwells within his believers is because of his resurrection. I mean, that's the only way it would be possible. If Christ had not resurrected, as the Apostle tells us, then we're still in our sins, And we're still dead in sins and trespass. However, Christ paid our penalty, took our sins with him down into the lower parts, and then broke the curse by resurrecting so we can have victory over sin and death. Amen? And the apostle goes into some detail concerning this. You know, when you think of Christ on the cross, This one saying where he's saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, he had to become sin for us. And so his father turns his back on him. So he could even experience what it is to be lost. You know, it's a terrible feeling to be lost. But he experienced that on the cross. Covered with sin, father turns his back. To have the feeling of being lost is a terrible feeling. I think uh, some of us had that feeling before we came to know him. Now, Josiah quoted one of our keynote passages in his last message from John twelve twenty four. I believe we have a picture up there, too. And it reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the crown, ground and die, It abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. We got that little picture? That one little seed going into the ground from that head can produce maybe 50. This one little seed may produce 50 to 100 kernels. But we're talking about reproduction here. And so one goes into the ground, you might get a hundred back. But of course, Jesus is referring to himself because he was going to be planted on our behalf and then resurrect within us. You know, we have resurrection life within us. You know that, right? He resurrected and his spirit dwells in those who believe. So this is the mystery that Paul refers to in Colossians one twenty six and 27, and if we'd like to look at those verses, Colossians one twenty six twenty seven, 27. And he says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from the generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you. Sometimes we need a fresh awakening and a fresh awareness of the fact that Christ is in us. Amen. He is in you. And the disciples were grieving when Christ said that he had to leave them, but he goes on to to tell them, look, I'm not going to leave you alone. The comforter is coming. And then he even says, I myself will come unto you. And then he even goes on from that. And he talks about even a greater deposit concerning Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, of course, that's relating to the greater works. Because there are limited degrees in which the Spirit of God dwells in people. And... I mean, this could not happen outside of his rising from the dead. 
So after his resurrection, he lives in all them that believe. Isn't that wonderful? The moment we believe upon him, his spirit enters into our life. And we have the spirit of his son within our hearts crying, Abba, Father. He's put his spirit within us. And I I do believe God wants us to become more aware of this revelation that he's in us. He speaks to us. He directs us. And I think much more than what we realize, too. So on that first evening that Christ arose, he enters into a locked room. He, in his new body, has uh, dimensions that we don't have. And he walks through the wall into his disciples who were hiding out for fear in John 20. And looking at John 20:20, 20, 20, it says, And when he had so said, he shewed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them. He breathed upon them. And saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, at this moment, these disciples were saved. The Spirit of God came into them. The Spirit of Christ came into them at that moment. They were saved. So we're talking about salvation experience. This is not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is salvation. Because he later commissions them to go and wait for the promise. So these disciples were saved. They had the Spirit of God. But there was yet another experience that they were to have. And that was 50 days later. So... Christ had mentioned to them that his spirit would dwell in them, and especially during that last night, because his disciples were feeling very low when he said, I'm, I'm going, and where I'm going, you can't come. So at times, Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit as the comforter, and the comforter was going to dwell with them. At other times, he mentions himself coming to them, and then the fullness of the Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead coming and making their abode in us. And again, I think that relates to the the greater works because that's why he said, you shall do greater works than I because there's a greater deposit of the Godhead within us. And I think we're looking to the last days to see some of that. Amen? You're going to do the greater works. So, I do believe the Spirit of God dwells within people to limited degrees. For example, I mean, Christians can limit God by not receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And you find people in the scriptures, actually, that were saved that had not even heard of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They were saved. They had the Spirit of God in them. That was a case in Acts uh, 19, I believe, in Ephesus. And Paul comes to them, and they were believers, but they had never even heard of the experience of the baptism. And so there are limited degrees. You see that also in Acts chapter 10. So... Some people can have a greater anointing than others, and there's a distinct difference between Christians that have this experience and those who do not. Amen? Let's consider a few verses here. Um, Let's look at John 16 for a minute. John 16, 7. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So now he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming, dwelling within them. 
And then backing up into chapter 14 and verses 16 through 18. And Jesus, again, this is in the upper room, and Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. He's referring to himself. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Lord himself. I mean, it's, sometimes I don't think we're aware that Christ is in us. That's the mystery hidden. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. He dwells within the heart of all those that believe. In fact, we're told that We have resurrection life within because the Spirit of Christ dwells within us. I mean, Christ's resurrection gives us a little picture of how it all plays out. I mean, in the end, you know, of course there are people here, I believe, that won't have to experience death. They can just be transformed. But for those who pass on, they're going to experience that resurrection life and Even those from centuries past are going to come alive again as Christ did with the new body. So all of the dead in Christ shall rise again. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, I know these are elementary truths, but it's good to hear them again, isn't it? It's always good to hear some of these truths again. And it says, Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. We have the spirit of God in us. Salvation. It's a wonderful thing. And I don't think we're aware sometimes of how he really leads us and guides us and speaks to us. But do you see that Christ was the corn of wheat that was going to fall into the ground and he was going to resurrect into the hearts of many people. We have Christ in us. Amen? Even as that seed germinates in the ground, you put a seed in the ground, it rots. And out of that rot, uh, germination, germination springs new life. And, of course, Paul uses that illustration in 1 Corinthians 15, but... But we can run away in the grave, but out of that corruption is going to come new life. And every atom is going to rematerialize, only it's going to be its immortal. Amen. Well, we want to be experience that resurrection on Resurrection Day, but we want to be a part of the first resurrection. Amen. We want to be a part of the marriage supper. Okay. Let's look at John fourteen twenty three, And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If a man love me, here's somebody who keeps the commandments, somebody is walking with God, we will come. That's a greater deposit. We will come and make our abode. And that's where he promises even the greater works to be done. So here's the greatest deposit of the Spirit to those who obey, those who walk in his ways. We will come. The fullness of the Godhead will come. Okay, let's consider Romans 8, 9. And the Apostle Paul said, For ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. We either have the Spirit of God in us or not. If we don't have the Spirit of God in us, we don't belong to him. We're not in the kingdom. That's what salvation is all about. 
It's like the first day that Jesus appeared to his disciples, and when they saw the resurrected Christ, they believed in him, and his spirit was transmitted into them. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That was their salvation experience. We have the Spirit of God within us. And let's rejoice in that. We have the Spirit of God in us. So here's the proof of salvation. There's a witness within. We find convictions that we didn't have before. Isn't that right? We have convictions that we didn't have before. We find ourselves communicating with God in a way that we didn't before. And we find him responding too. And answer. in fact, even this past week, I was kind of saying, Lord, I need to hear from you. I, um, I mean, we're going through a hard time right now, but Lord, I really need to hear from you. And, you know, I got a call from another state, another minister. And um, he was sharing a few things with me, but then he wanted to pray with me, and which turned into prophetic uh, word, and he prophesied over me for about five to ten minutes, and really it just ministered to me. It was the Spirit of God in him ministering to me and answering the heart cry of myself. So the proof of salvation, he's put the Spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. We also find checks in the spirit that we didn't know before. When we go to do something, do you ever feel a check in your spirit? I mean, one time, my family, myself, we were, I even forget where it was. It was, we were touring something, and there was a certain room that they were going to take us into, and I felt a check. Don't go in there. It kind of stopped me right in my tracks. But God has a way of of checking us when we're making a a wrong move or something that's going to defile us or something like that. Have you ever had that happen to you? Where you felt a check? Like, no. So the Spirit of God guides us as such, sometimes allows roadblocks to keep us from going a certain direction. Spirit of God can speak to us in dreams, visions, can speak to us through his word. I'm sure we've all had a word quicken to us, amen? Or God can speak through other people, or even with the billboard along the road. God, did you ever have the Lord speak to you through a billboard? Just at the right time, you're just asking a question and there. There's the answer right on the billboard along the road. The Spirit of God works in many different ways. But, um, you know, there's that beautiful witness. I mean, going back when I really committed my life to the Lord, we're talking well over 50 years ago, but the Lord gave me a dream of heaven, and I saw the end of my life coming in to the presence of the Lord and feeling such joy unspeakable. I mean, it was a witness within my heart. There was a witness in my life that things had changed. I felt a joy that, you know, I've never experienced before in my life. Isn't it wonderful to have the Spirit of God in you? The Lord led us to a certain church. I've told this story many times. And there was a witness every week. I could walk in with the most obscure verse, and it would come out during the service. And to the very day that the Lord dismissed us from that church, there was a witness. There was a witness within, witness of God. So, in every way, you know, God has a way of, in every circumstance, God has a way of speaking to us. Even when I wanted to, going way back, I was wondering, Lord, should I go to Bible school? The Lord spoke through his word. He gave me a word from John 7. It was concerning Christ, but the Lord was quickening that verse to me 
where they were saying of Christ, how does this man know having never learned? He's never been to school. They are saying that of Christ, but the Lord was quickening that verse to me. Well, I never did go to Bible school as a student, but I went there to teach. In fact, 40 years ago, this, this very, probably this month, probably 40 years ago, I was there teaching in Bible school, but I'd never attended Bible school. So the Lord has a way of speaking to us. And then I remember when it was, we had a more sizable church than we do now, but, um, and the Lord was saying, I want you to go full time into the ministry. And people were saying that to me, you need to go full time into the ministry. Well, I was working in the meat business. I was a meat manager at the time. And so one Sunday afternoon, I was communing with the Lord and I was saying, Lord, if you really want me to go full time into the ministry, give me a call on the phone. Ring. Phone rings. Picked it up. Thus saith the Lord, hang up the meat cleaver and start cleaving hearts. End of conversation. Well, I didn't need any more witness than that. Uh, I mean, that it's never happened before or since. But, you know, the Spirit of God has a way of witnessing to your life. Amen? Many ways God can speak. And we're talking about the Spirit of Christ within resurrection life. I think the greatest witness, too, comes after you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. My life totally changed after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But the mystery hidden from the beginning is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he's going to dwell in our hearts by faith, and he's going to direct our lives by his spirit. And I'll tell you what, as we're coming into these last days, we're in the last days, really, we want to be directed more and more because we're going to have to live by the faith of the Son of God in these last days in many ways. The hope of glory. Well, you know, the Old Testament saints, um, when they died, there was a fear in death because they were only, they, their sins had been atoned for, the believers, but the conscious, conscience has never been purged by the blood of Jesus, just the blood of bulls and goats, which could atone but couldn't cleanse the conscience. So there was a fear in death. Even good saints, when they went to the grave, there was a certain fear and trepidation when they went to the grave. And just quoting here from Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 14 and 15, it says, uh, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Christ had to become a man in order to die. God can't die, so he had to put on flesh and blood so that he could die. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There was a fear in death. And in the Old Testament, the saints didn't go up to heaven. They went down into paradise, the saints. And, you know, it was, it was a different story. There was a certain fear, trepidation, and death in the Old Testament because they had a consciousness of things that they'd done in the past. Even though they had been forgiven, there was not the cleansing of the conscience that the blood of Christ of, um, gives to us. So... Then there was a sin nature, of course, in the Old Testament they were contending with, which it was a struggle. It was a struggle with the sin nature because it was all human effort. In the New Testament, we have the upper hand. Why? Because Christ is in us. 
And as we yield to his spirit, we have dominion. In fact, the scripture says that the elder shall serve the younger. Well, the elder nature is the one we were born with, Adam. The new nature is Christ. The elder nature, the Adamic nature, has to serve the younger nature, which is Christ. Amen? So we have the dominion over the old Adam. Isn't that good news? So that is a new covenant promise. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall have dominion over it. So since Christ, we can not only experience having our conscience totally cleansed, but we have the hope of glory. And, of course, we can apply that to the resurrection. But also, I believe in the last days, there's going to be a a spectacular revival. And I believe that Christ is going to be glorified in his saints during that revival, too. In fact, there are verses that say that, that he wants to be glorified in his saints. Amen? So, we're talking about manifesting through signs and wonders which we need to see to convince an ungodly world today so in conclusion no man can get to heaven unless the spirit of Christ is in him if we don't have the spirit of God in us then we do not belong to him we have to have the spirit of God in us Amen. if any man have not the spirit of God he's none of his So that's what takes place. When we believe, there's a transmission of his spirit into us. He's in us. There's a witness. We're thinking different. All of my thought life changed. I mean, no, all of these things aren't immediate, but everything begins to change. It's like like the dawning of a new day. The sun is beginning to come up, and things are beginning to, to dawn for the first time in your life, and Things are changing in your life. Amen? You begin to think about God and his ways and his word. And that's what Easter is all about. Amen. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have Christ within in this earthen vessel that decays and rots away. But we have a treasure within us. It's Christ in you. Amen. Aren't you happy for Resurrection Day? Christ in you. And, you know, I think we should just even pray more that that Christ would manifest himself to us um, in greater ways. And, you know, we should be more cognizant of the fact that he's there and he wants to light, uh, guide us and to check us if we're going wrong, the wrong direction. We want to, to be constantly aware of his presence, that he is in you. Amen. The hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what Easter is about. Praise God.